Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session panel on state of the evidence in digital agriculture. My name is Maria Camilla Gomez, and I will be the moderator for the session. So let's start off by giving a short introduction to the session panel. From seeds to field and market to plate, digital interventions are accelerating local and global food systems transformation. However, insights on the growing trend of digital innovations in food systems and the evidence of impact remain scant and scattered, leading to knowledge and evidence gap. The session, State of the Evidence in Digital Agriculture, will discuss the current state of evidence in digital agriculture and sustainable development, as well as how stakeholders can provide resources to connect efforts and interventions. In addition, this conversation will explore what is at stake for championing the potential of digital agriculture for promoting evidence-based learning and decision-making to accelerate food systems transformation. So our panel members today are Riza Fabregas. Riza is an assistant professor of economics and public affairs at the LBJ School of Public Affairs of the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on evaluating interventions to improve service delivery in developing countries, including the evaluation of digital agricultural initiatives. She will provide a perspective on recent re evidence on the potential of digital extension approaches. Our second speaker today will be Jaron Porcello. She is an information and data scientist at Cornell University in the Department of Global Development. She is a primary investigator and co-director of Ceres 2030, Sustainable Solutions to End Hunger, a three-year and multinational initiative to support donor decision-making as they explore their role in the international effort to end hunger. And for our final speaker today will be Jonathan Mokshaw. He is a research scientist economist at the Alliance of Biodiversity in Seattle co-leader of the Digital Food Systems Evidence Clearinghouse. He conducts research at the interface of food systems, digital agricultural innovations, and nutrition-sensitive agriculture. Using evidence, he engages in formal and alternative policy processes to nudge policy decisions, to rearrange investments, and scale out agricultural innovations to accelerate food systems transformation. So now I will pass on the word to Riza. Riza? All right, so thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to be here today. So let me start very quickly by motivating why I think there's you know, this growing interest in agricultural digital approaches. And I think the first reason is that, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons to think why better information can help small smallholder farmers in developing countries, particularly because I think that there's a lot of different agricultural technologies that could be adopted and that could increase productivity, but we see low uh, rates of adoption. So I think information could help in that space. The second reason is that what you're seeing is this chart, which is that the fraction of the population with access to a mobile phone has increased massively in the last 20 years. Right? And so this has really opened up a lot of opportunities to deliver information at scale in a timely manner, but also in a very cheap way. So I think this has like made people very excited about sort of like these types of approaches. And when we start thinking about like what is digital agriculture, we're really thinking about, you know, uh, a different range of services and different uh, information and communication technologies, right? But something to keep in mind is that technology is also advancing pretty rapidly. And so there are many things that we can do with what already exists and, and the existing evidence uh, is on that. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But I also want to highlight that there is a lot of potential for improving over time, right? And so we've seen sort of advances in remote sensing. And so we might think that, you know, measuring yields through satellites, that's going to improve how we can evaluate different programs. We can think that you know, improvements in machine learning can improve how we personalize and customize information to farmers. And we could also think that things that the adoption of smartphones in developing countries is also gonna open up a lot of opportunities for more sophisticated approaches in how we use sort of these tools to, to inform farmers and, and to help sort of the value chain perform better. That being said, I think there's a lot of grounds for skepticism on 
whether you know farmers actually need information and how effective these approaches are going to be and even if we sort of like provide information to farmers how much are they going to change their behavior how much are they going to like uh, you know these interventions are actually going to do something for productivity is it just the case that one provides information and you know farmers might end up sort of disregarding it or, or treating it as spam and so something that I've been uh, working on, and this is um, work with Frank Schilbeck and Michael Kramer, is trying to collect evidence on some of these issues so we can assess sort of like where the impacts are in terms of in behavior, in terms of sort of like crop yields. So what we've done is to collect multiple studies, uh, uh, and I'll explain in a second this slide, but we collect the multiple studies and summarize them through a meta-analysis. So this particular slide is showing you six different studies of basic uh, programs that try to, incre try to increase the use of agricultural lime in East Africa. And so soil acidity is a problem in East Africa. Agricultural lime is a cheap solution, right? And so what we're gonna evaluate is these programs that were implemented by different organizations trying to figure out whether the recommendations sent by text messages, so a very cheap, low touch information actually changed the behavior of farmers uh, as measured through input purchases. And so what we're seeing in this chart is, you know, each row is one study. The dots are sort of the point estimates and the lines are confidence intervals. And then we have like a summary measure uh, at the bottom, which is that blue diamond. Uh, and you see it's like 1.22, which implies that the, the, the programs increase the odds of following the recommendations by 22%. And so we think these effects are modest, right? So it's not sort of like huge impacts, but the important thing to realize here is that these interventions cost like pennies, right? So the implied benefit cost ratio of, of these type of interventions is approximately nine to one, right? So modest impacts, but very cheap, so, uh, it, you know, these makes, it makes sense to, to invest in these types of programs. Uh, this is evidence, so similar evidence, so we're scanning the literature of uh, other research work that has measured impacts in terms of increases in crop yields. So the top panel is showing programs where the information was delivered directly to farmers. And the bottom panel is showing programs where the information was delivered uh, by an extension worker or by other type of field worker. And again, we see sort of like positive but modest impacts, right? And so the, again, the diamonds are summarizing the impacts and we find is that in these trials, uh, these type of interventions increase yields by an average of uh, 4%, right? So I just wanna like highlight that, you know, average impacts are, are modest, uh, 4%, but the cost of these programs is pretty low. So there might be sort of like a, a, a clear rationale to be investing uh, in these types of interventions. Uh, there has been other work looking at the effects on market uh, level impacts. And so there's evidence that uh, programs that try to provide information about uh, the price of crops, uh, so output price, can really improve the, like the market as a whole, right? So different papers have shown that, you know, providing farmers uh, and the entire market with this type of information can reduce consumer prices, but also increase profits for sellers. And so other, other types of um, researchers have follow up with, with different papers and found similar results, though in some cases the facts have been null, so there it's a little bit more mixed. So, where do we go from here? So I want to make like a couple of points out of this and then we can open up to like, um, you know, more discussion later on in the panel. But so the first thing that I want to make uh, sure that I convey is that, you know, our best estimates suggest that the benefits of current digital extension programs are modest in absolute terms, but they exceed the cost because, you know, delivering these uh, interventions is so cheap. The second thing is that I think there's a lot of potential for these types of programs to increase their impacts in the future. And that might be because there's a lot of scope for optimizing what we already have through, you know, the behavioral science to improve messages, 
to really trying to like figure out how to better convey information to farmers, how to work with government systems to make them like more reactive and like user friendly, but also because there's scope for new technologies to be used, right? And, and so that's gonna like increase our ability to, to optimize systems, to provide better services to farmers. Uh, and the third point that I wanna make is that we can also think of evidence as a public good, right? So it doesn't make sense for everyone who's working in this space to be reinventing the wheel, trying to figure out what works and it doesn't work in digital agriculture, but rather it makes sense to really try to create systems where we can like share lessons, uh, where we can share data uh, that are really transparent and where we can share sort of like all these results so we can build better systems in the future. So that's all, all I have for, for this. Hello, my name is Jaren Porciello. I'm in the Department of Global Development at Cornell University. Thank you for the invitation to present at the 2020 platform for big data and agriculture on the state of evidence for digital agriculture. I'm pleased to be able to present a new scoping study that we have in progress called Agriculture in the Digital Age. This study is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and USAID in cooperation with a number of other international partners, including CGIR, World Bank, and FAO. And what we aim to do is to discover, map, and evaluate how the proliferation of digital technology and data analytics in agriculture is contributing to the lives of farmers and agricultural service providers in developing world economies. And this is a really tall order. And I'm very glad to be able to follow on the previous panelists focus of the study, maybe to be able to inform some of the questions about how do we bring all of this data together, synthesize it, analyze it and make it publicly available for others to use. But first, I want to give just a little bit of big picture context to help us think about what's already out there. We already have business intelligence studies that have been conducted by groups like CTA and Dahlberg and released in 2019. We've got great public sector reports being produced by groups like FAO, USAID and World Bank. Marketplace case studies that are being offered by groups like GSMA, Mercy Corps and Digital Green. And then of course, millions of impact and evaluation and peer review studies conducted not only by some of the partners that I've just named, but other individual researchers who are based in universities, NGOs, and other places around the world. And our job in a scoping study is to think about how does all this information come together and what does it all mean? And in particular, I wanna point out that we as the research community, we do a very good job producing research. But where we are in our infancy is thinking about how we synthesize all of this research in meaningful ways. How do we bring together qualitative, quantitative, mixed method studies, all with different sample sizes conducted in various geographies? How do we bring all of that information together in a meaningful way? And I don't think the answer is that we just don't do it or that we only focus on the highest quality research. We have a responsibility to evaluate all of the knowledge that's been produced by ourselves and our colleagues over the past 20 years. But as you see in the slide in front of you, we have a babble of research that we sit on. And I'm giving you a litany of statistics here that I'm not going to go over. But I think that it is fair to say that it's difficult to be able to accurately synthesize the information. And other communities like the health community have methods by which they do this called systematic and scoping reviews. Their databases though, and their data sets look very different than our data sets in agriculture. However, it's still useful to be able to use the mixed methods approach to be able to synthesize all of this research. And one of the reasons that it's important to be able to do this is because we want to be able to capture the last mile of research. And by this, I mean research that, as my colleagues have described already, research that specifically evaluates specific interventions um, and, and how they have impacted the lives of beneficiaries. That is to say, our beneficiaries are primarily small scale producers, as well as service providers, such as processors, traders, so on and so forth, who operate in the market space. How do we actually capture the studies that give us data on those communities 
when it is published by so many different groups and under so many different formats. And that's what we set out to do in this project, to synthesize this body of research. And so far, we've aggregated about 7,500 individual studies using a machine learning process that we've developed at Cornell to help us quickly winnow down much of this research. Now we're looking at about 2,000 studies that look promising to us. And we're continuing to screen all of those studies in order to produce a, synth a synthesis report, an online database for the global community to be able to use. We're also talking to stakeholder experts and considering all of the different indicators that we need to be able to bring together to measure digitally enabled services for agriculture. And one of the things that I hope we talk about as part of this panel today and later on with discussants is how do we build common ground about what we know works in the agricultural space, but where we may not have enough evidence and data. How do we then go and build upon some of the knowledge that we already have to be able to put into action interventions that we think may make a, li a difference in the lives of beneficiaries. I look forward to having a chance to speak with my co-panelists about some of these questions today. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Moksha, Research Economics at the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT. And I'm very excited to contribute to this panel, including Jaron and also Reza and following through their presentation, which contributes to the state of evidence of digital agriculture. I'll be talking about agriculture 4.0. What is the state of evidence of digital agriculture? And this is the core team behind this work. Uh, Brian, who is a evidence clearinghouse guru, and Marianne Camila, who is our evidence gathering master, and also content and web management by Marianne and Stefan. Agriculture, as we know, is currently in the face of the digital revolution era. And prior to this, there's been other phases, including when we're just domesticating crops and animals, moving from just simple cultivation with basic implements and managing natural resources and then moving through that to the second revolution, which also was influenced by the industrial era and moving into heavy mechanization. And then the third phase, which is the green revolution. What we see in this phase is the use of a lot of digital tools and these digital tools are influencing the way we farm and also how we cultivate and use information to increase agricultural productivity. And the landscape is quite messy because there are a lot of emerging technologies that we see almost every day in every part of the food system, starting from pre-production to consumption, aggregation, and also in the distribution phase. The question then is, is there a way to categorize all these interventions which are influencing the way we farm now and accelerating food system transformation? And how do we know if there is an impact or there is no impact? And especially which part of the food system does such emerging technologies influence? There's been a lot of criticisms and also skepticisms regarding how digital agriculture actually contributes to improving the three Ps. In this case, people in terms of inclusion. Second, planet, how we harness the resources in a sustainable way. And third, the profit, how to make such venture profitable. These are questions that need answers, but currently we have both an evidence and a knowledge cap. And how to respond to this is using data and evidence. And one way is the creation of the digital food systems evidence clearinghouse. And from this, we've been able to gather over 40 matured innovations in different parts of the world using 67 indicators in total in 56 countries currently. From this, what we see as emerging technologies in different parts of the world, um, in areas that we can classify as 
high spot regions and low spot regions. And when we look at India, Kenya, and Ethiopia, these are areas that we classify as high spots regions, having nine to 15 matured innovations currently. And in Ghana, Burkina Faso, Tanzania, and Colombia, and parts of Nicaragua, we also have such emerging technologies having an average of three to nine with Burkina Faso, Niger, and Nigeria also included different innovations currently. So we see a rapid spread and these emerging technologies are influencing the way people farm and somehow has a potential influence in increasing agricultural productivity. Using the food systems framework, what we see is that there is a high concentration of these innovations in what we define as the upstream food system component. So basically in the aggregation phase, we have over 60% of such innovations currently, and the rest is distributed among other parts of the food system with very low amount of innovation in the consumption space. The primary target of such innovations are largely farmers and Quite often, what we see is that such innovations come in the form of agricultural advisory extension services. And we also find a few which are targeting financial service provision and also inputs in terms of mechanization. The different innovations are distributed within the different regions with high concentration currently in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia with a few also in Latin America and the Caribbean. And agricultural extension is also quite heavy, specifically for South Sub-Saharan Africa. And innovation is targeting climate change, finance, and also crop production are uh, also found in these regions. In terms of impacts, looking at the distribution for the social impact of innovations, the environmental the economic and the technical impact, we see that the technical impact is recorded to be higher than all the other dimensions. And this has implications on how to bring in social inclusion, youth empowerment, and also women participation within the digital agriculture era. Next, in terms of efficiency, we also see that efficiency is quite high, which means that the digital innovations have a high potential, increasing efficiency, in this case, improving the use of agrochemicals, for example, or increasing productivity, we see that it's between 25 to about 75% for all the innovations that have been recorded so far. So the key lessons here is that there is a rapid spread of these innovations and definitely we need to find a way to take advantage of them. The high concentration within the upstream activity needs to be balanced with some other innovations in downstream activities. And the impact also needs to be improved for both economic and social in order to increase maturity and also scaling out of such innovations. And complementary activities within the policy space, the business models that are needed to increase such innovations are also key in tracking the impact will be fundamental to scaling out mature innovations. Over. Wow, really interesting presentations, everyone. Thank you all for providing your insights on the state of evidence in digital agriculture. So I think after listening to your presentations, I think we can make a really good cross-panel discussion out of this. So um, I have a lot of questions for each and every one of you, um, but I'm going to start with Riza. So, um, I think this question um, is for Riza and Jerome, actually. So why do you guys think it's so difficult to evaluate the evidence base for agriculture? Uh, sure. Uh, so, look, I think there's this broader perspective and, I, you know, I'm hoping that Jaron will talk a little bit more about this and like, you know, all these different, uh, you know, pieces of the evidence and how do we aggregate all these things. And it seems like her project uh, is about that a little bit. Let me focus a little bit on my specialty, which is sort of like thinking about impact evaluations of these type of, of interventions. And I think there's uh, several empirical challenges that come up when thinking about these um, 
these evaluations. Like first is like we don't have that many rigorous evaluations uh, of these digital programs that end up measuring impacts on behavior change or crop yields or profits, which is ultimately, you know, what many of us care about. So I think many studies are relying on farmers' perceptions of these, you know, interventions or, or only measures or knowledge change, but we don't know how that's going to translate into actual actions, right? The second thing is like a lot of these studies are relying on, you know, survey data uh, and that's self-reported. And so we might worry about like, you know, how much is there like social desirability bias of farmers? You know, you give them an intervention, they're trying to be polite. Are they just going to report like this is a great intervention? So I think we need to think about that as an issue. And the third thing that I think is actually quite important is to think that studies with small sample sizes usually do not have sufficient statistical power to detect small impacts, right? But because these interventions are so cheap, actually small impacts are going to be very important to detect, right? Because small impacts can be uh, cost effective. So we really need to start thinking about how can we measure all of these things at scale, and that's going to be quite expensive if you want to collect data. So that's what I think like new technologies like satellites that can measure like crop yields can really like make a push in this area. Thank you, Raisa. Thank you. Um, Jerome, do you want to add up to that? Um, maybe Jonathan also, if you want to um, give us some insights about this question as well. Sure. So I can, I'll go first and I'll build on a lot of what Raisa said. So that I think there's, um, we don't have sort of this level of research that kind of closes the last mile that has effectively analyzed the impact of an intervention on the targeted beneficiary. And I would say not only do we have kind of low powered studies in terms of sample sizes, it's not always clear that we're actually targeting the right group of, of beneficiaries, right, when we conduct these studies. So if we, we small scale producers are not a homogenous group. Right? There's some small scale producers that have more or less access to finance. Some people have more or less access to uh, market spaces, to banking, to all of these different things. And so we do a real disservice to ourselves when we say we want to evaluate the impact of interventions on small scale farmers without thinking about the more uh, kind of sub communities, women, youth, elderly, uh, people who are at different levels of finance. Um, and so I think this is something that we've got to continue to kind of talk about as, you know, with, with one another. Um, as colleagues, who is our target population? And that is almost um, independent of what the sample size is. So there's a lot of good qualitative research that has a smaller sample size potentially, but also um, targets the, the right group in terms of the beneficiaries. Um, and I think that this issue comes to a head when we look at digital interventions, because there's so many more variables that come into play, not only just access to technology, but also access to, um, you know, the, the infrastructure that leads to good technology adoption. But then we face different levels of literacy. We face all, I mean, just a whole nother litany of factors come into play when we talk about um, thinking about the interventions specific for digital agriculture. Um, and I would just say that we're, you know, we're constantly thinking about these problems and we're thinking about these problems as research problems. Then one of the things that, that I'm trying to kind of bring up in this study and in the work that I do is what's sort of the meta science around all of this? How do we actually kind of create the systems and the methodologies that allow us to effectively do this so that as researchers, we're not always reinventing the wheel each and every time we address these problems. Um, so let me pause there and give Jonathan maybe a chance to come in on this question too. Thanks, Maria. All right, great. Um, I think th those are really great insights from Jaron and Reza, and I fully agree to all those points. And we also see that if we look at the digital agricultural space in itself, um, we have development programs which are not really thinking about evidence um, to a big extent. And we have startups who are springing up a lot. And with all this, the question is, do they really have the capacity and the resources to go into rigorous ev evidence assessment? Not really. And that's where researchers and others really come in. And what I see so far is that in terms of accessing or examining such impacts in itself, we see that there is quite some huge gap. One, we have a lot of digital innovations that are coming up. 
and to to measure the evidence as um, Jaron kind of brought out there are multiples of factors that needs to be looked into so we really need to think about very innovative ways I mean we, we can go into the RCTs the quiz experimental approaches and everything but are there also some low cost approaches that can be used based on specific indicators as we find in Jaron's project for example and think about how to measure across the food system using such specific indicators and really see to what extent does it lead to an impact or provide evidence for improving um, the food systems or digital innovations within the food system. So we, we need both the rigorous and also low cost approaches, but if we really want to show the evidence fast and quick, because time is not on our side for anything that consumes too much time to show the evidence, then we also need to find some low cost approaches. Thank you, John. Um, and now that I have you here, you were presenting um, the evidence, the initiative of the Evidence Clearinghouse. So I have a question. Could you explain in some details about the Digital Food Systems Framework? Oh, the Digital Food Systems Evidence Framework, it's a new framework that we've developed uh, within the Alliance, within the CG platform for big data. And the framework basically is motivated by the fact that digital innovations as a goal is trying to accelerate food system transformation or moving from less sustainable approaches of producing to a more sustainable food system. So based on that, we bring in one aspect of the sustainability framework, which looks at economics, environmental, and also social dimensions within a political institutional framework and then also looking at the food system it's always uh, starts from pre-production to post-consumption and all the intermediaries we see that that also gives us a second framework to think about the food system and then third looking at digital innovations the different forms of innovations we are bringing these three different frameworks together into one and looking at how digital innovations intersect or interact with each of these different dimensions, whether the food system or the sustainability framework. And we've been able to develop this new framework, which I think would give us some ideas in terms of which indicators are important and also how to create standardized protocols for measuring low cost evidence. Thank you, John. Um, I have a question now um, for Riza. So what do you think, Riza, are the promising areas of future work? So that's a good question. Um, I think a little bit depends on sort of what are we talking about. So something I, I talked about in the presentation is sort of there's a lot of opportunities for sort of like new technologies and we don't know much about that because we haven't uh, evaluated those and how well they're going to work sort of in the field, right? So thinking about sort of those approaches, uh, I think that's promising. I think thinking about how to optimize current systems, how to, you know, Jaron is talking about sort of heterogeneity of different groups and how to sort of like target those people. And I think we can do a lot more with like current techniques to try to better customize and personalize information to farmers so it's more useful. So I think better understanding how to do that and evaluating whether those approaches actually work, uh, that's quite promising. Uh, and I think like there's also a lot of opportunities in different parts of the value chain, right? So I talked a lot about sort of like very basic approaches of conveying information to farmers via like mobile phones and you know, what do they do with that information? But I think if we start thinking about like, look, it's not only, you know, digital agriculture is not only just giving information to farmers, it can also be, you know, working with agro dealers so that they better stocks or like input is working with like, you know, output sellers is working with like different parts and like thinking about different systems that could like help uh, issues in that, you know, that are uh, impeding the, the work of those value chains. Thank you, Raisa. And now that you're mentioning all the different parts, um, I have a question for all of you. Um, maybe we can discuss something about who the consumers of these evidence are or should be. I'll take a shot at answering that, and, and but it'll be, uh, I think it's a great question, and I don't have a great answer. I know who some of the consumers are that, that are interested in this evidence, but when we say who the consumers should be, 
Well, it should be each other, certainly, as researchers. Um, but more importantly, it, 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 it should be a dialogue that we're having with our intended beneficiaries. And I know that this happens within research teams and it happens kind of at the local level when we work with local partners, but it doesn't really happen enough. Um, and so I think the street then can come the other way where we also want to think about how are we meaningfully able to take in a lot more information that's um, what I'm going to say is kind of undocumented information, but lessons learned where we're able to kind of take in interviews um, and, and more anecdotal evidence into our own work stream. But I, I love the question, who should the consumers be? Um, yeah, I'll turn it to my colleagues to see, to see how they want to inform on this. Maybe if I just jump in quickly following Gerona, I think everyone, um, everyone in the sense that we are all parts of the food system and we all have different roles and different things that we are contributing. And so if we look at it that way, then I would also say we first of all need to think about packaging the information based on our consumers. So if we need specific information to nudge donors to implement specific programs, then we need to have a targeted evidence that is specific for them. If we need something for the farmers who are primary stakeholders who have to implement most of the things, then we also need to think about how to generate relevant evidence that meets their needs. But especially the decision makers, um, the policy makers, and how to engage with them with such evidence within alternative and formal spaces, I think will be critical if we want to include everyone, uh, in this case, um, meet the three piece people, planet and profitability. Um, to accelerate food system transformation, we, we, we need everyone and decision makers will play a key role because they will have to put in the money, they will have to think about investments, uh, private sector. So we, 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 we first need to think about the evidence, the who and how to keep the evidence to them. And I think everyone will play a role. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with all of that. I think, you know, through the presentations, all of us have called for, you know, I think there's need for more evidence uh, on this, but also, you know, how to better aggregate this evidence. And so I think we all want to see sort of these transparency and these data sharing and, you know, but also we don't want to be in a situation where all of these just, you know, uh, lives in a website that no one really visits or anything like that. So thinking about how we create feedback loops to other people, and that could be researchers who are working on these issues, so they inform on sort of what's the state of the evidence, so they can like look for new areas, right? It could be like policymakers and implementers of private sector, NGOs, governments that are going to use these lessons to develop uh, sort of like their own programs and interventions. So I think we definitely need to think a lot more about how to strengthen those uh, feedback loops. Something where I am like pretty optimistic about and this is some of the lessons that we drew when we were sort of like reviewing uh, some of the evidence is that when we work with governments you know what we were seeing is that the government failures uh, that we think about sort of in any type of implementation of services it was not the usual failures uh, of corruption or something like that when it came to digital agriculture something that we saw is that you know, governments usually, um, you know, uh, might create sort of systems that are technically correct, right? So Ministry of Agriculture that, you know, create very uh, technically correct recommendations to farmers or, or systems like that. Uh, and they were not thinking so much about how to make these systems like more user friendly, right? So in a couple of studies, we saw that, you know, things like simplifying the information to farmers, so it's like in useful, you know, in useful terms that they could use, actually made a big impact on what farmers could do and like governments are pretty responsive to that kind of evidence right like for them it's pretty easy to change sort of what they're already doing and like uh, make it better so i'm pretty hopeful that you know governments are going to be pretty responsive to to these sort of tweaks and to evidence about how to make programs uh, a lot more effective yeah thank you very much that was very um informative um, I do have a question for Jaron because you mentioned um, in your presentation about capturing the last mile of research. So what does this mean? 
So I think this is what we've we've kind of all been articulating is thinking about not only so research goes through many different stages, right? And I think as a research community, we're very good at capturing um, innovations that are coming out of laboratories, innovations that are coming out of um, kind of molecular or genetic research. We're, we're able to kind of capture those results on an ongoing basis. But given that, uh, you know, from the time something particularly a plant in agriculture is developed until the time it can be field tested and you can actually see the impact that's having on a community. This is a lifespan of about 10 years. So it's an incredibly long window of research. And I think what, I mean, what we're seeing kind of evidence of happening is that we have a lot of research kind of in the early stages where people are in the development, we're in kind of the theoretical stages. We're thinking very clearly about the practical problems, but we haven't had an opportunity to yet test out how those practical problems are actually making an impact on the community. Um, and I think maybe just the kind of the other thing to highlight on this is that um, we're not really given we're not really given a lot of funding to be able to do this. So as researchers and research organizations and in the academy, we're we're kind of more steered into um, research that is you know, theoretical, that's conceptual, and that's problem-based, rather than more applied lenses into the research. Um, and so to, in order to be able to really capture this last mile of research, to be able to capture what the impact, you know, what is the impact of all of these different types of interventions and approaches, um, I think, and I, and I am seeing evidence of this with my colleagues, that it is up to us to be able to kind of ask for this funding to make sure that we're really able to capture what's not going to happen within the first three years of a grant or the first five years of the grant, but to be able to come back to these problems and have a rigorous evaluation plan um, to, to sort of capture where the research started and then where it ended. Um, and I know for myself, I haven't seen a great process for this um, take place yet with most of the funding agents that funding agencies that I work with, um, but it is a question that's on everyone's mind. And so I, I'm hopeful that in the next you know, two to three to four years that we do see some more models that come forward that actually help us um, not only think through how do we answer this question, but funding models that kind of respond to allow us to be able to capture um, this, this last mile of research. Thank you, Darren. Um, I have a question for Jonathan and the initiative of the Digital Food System Evidence Clearinghouse. So how did you compile the data, ensure the quality, reason for the standard indicator protocol, and uh, most important, is the data available to the public? Um, yes, uh, that's a great question. Um, so coming back to what I would describe as um, a low cost um, way of capturing evidence, uh, what we did was basically following up from the description of the food systems framework um, to develop specific indicators for each of the dimensions. So if we look at the sustainability in, from the social, economic and environmental, design specific sub indicators for each of them. And then also if we pick up the interventions itself, whether it's targeting production, aggregation, consumption, or distribution to also design specific indicators or sub indicators for each of them. And based on this, we came out with 67 indicators in total, which looks at the entire food system and also the sustainability angle of it. And based on this, we captured the data specifically, um, calling for submission of evidence as one approach. So people can submit the evidence using an online tool that we've designed as part of the platform for big data in agriculture. And from there, we've been able to receive a number of innovations so far that has come in. And we also evaluated our own innovations within the CE and also called for submission of evidence using that same framework and indicators. And currently also we are digging through the literature. So based on this, we've been able to come up with about 40 mature innovations in total currently. And those protocols are available. The data is also um, currently, some of them are publicly available, but not everything. So we are updating and people can download the data. Yes, and finally, um, on the quality component. So what we did was we have the, as, as part of the, um, communities of practice of um, the big data platform. What we did was we have leading experts who examine the submissions that come in 
and they use a standard protocol that we've developed as well. And that standard protocol looks at first the rigorousness of the uh, of the evidence. So was it using RCT or basically just using a quasi experimental or some other ways of capturing the evidence? And the second thing they also did was to look at the stage of maturity of the innovation as a second area of evaluating the evidence and in which part of the food system is covering. So we use this leading experts who are independent and globally based and have knowledge of the evidence as a way to look at the quality. Thank you, John. So I think we're going to finalize now our Q&A session. Um, but I, before we end things, I do want to, of course, thank you all for presenting your insights. Um, Riza, Jaron, and Jonathan, this has been really interesting and um, you guys have provided really good insights on the state of evidence in digital agriculture. Um, but before we finalize, I do want to ask you if you can summarize in about 30 seconds uh, any concluding insights, any conclusions that you want to make. Um, in just 30 seconds, what would it be? All right, so let me go first. Uh, and I wanna make just three quick points. So the first point is uh, from what we know, digital agricultural uh, programs uh, seem to have a lot of promise because we're in a place where, you know, many people have access to uh, phones so we can reach people at scale. And these interventions are super cheap, right? So very promising so far. The second point is that what the evidence what evidence we have is, and what we know is not necessarily what will be, right? So I think there's a lot of promise for thinking about how we can optimize these programs in the long run. And the third thing, which is something that comes out from everyone is that these, like creating of, this creation of evidence is a global public good, right? So there are economies of scale in creating this evidence. And the more we can like figure out how to create systems that create and aggregate evidence, the better uh, it's going to be. All right. So th we are living currently in the digital agriculture era, and that's something that we need to live with and also include everyone. And at the same time, make sure that the planet and the profit dimensions are also being fulfilled. But there is a lot of skepticism now and concerns about the potential of digital innovations to help us achieve the three piece profit people and also planet now based on this we need evidence in order to be able to move this forward and especially accelerate the transformation agenda and such evidence needs to be collected fast and quick and in low cost approaches and based on that, we think that we'll be able to accelerate the food system transformation. So my call is that let's build this evidence together. Let's bring all the stakeholders together. Let's examine business models and bring in the private sector and accelerate food system transformations using digital innovations. So I would like to make kind of a call to action. We have a lot of researchers around the world from agriculture, from behavioral sciences, geographers, and economists, many more, who are all interested in digital agriculture. And we have policymakers who are interested in making these investments as well as private sector partners. And I think in order to make sure that we don't repeat any of the mistakes of the past, um, and that we're thinking about all of the different, not only promises that this technology offers, but also some of the possible um, exploitive uses of the technology that we really need to be thinking about all of the different privacy issues um, and the different um, potential uh, uh, negative impacts of this technology. Not so that we stymie progress, but so that we're well informed of what may be. And so I would encourage um, kind of us as a community to think about what are the programs that we need to build, uh, the research programs, the stakeholder programs that actually bring the right um, expertise together so that we're not just focusing on what happens in agriculture, but what happens when people have access to technology um, and so on and so forth. So thank you very much. Yes, so as um, Riza, Jaron, and Jonathan just mentioned, um, so this doesn't end here, there's still much work left to build on the state of evidence on digital agriculture. 
Um, but I do want to thank you all for um, these amazing presentations and of course um, thank our audience for joining our session.